Okay, so now you should be world experts at using common sense to draw little structures. 99.999% of the time, that's what you need. And certainly when you get into organic chemistry, um, everything you're going to do for the fundamental basic structures will be using common sense. So it's so important you get really good at that. But as this is where we talk about Lewis structures, where we talk about molecular structure and so forth, we do need to realize that there are some things that will violate common sense. They'll still be happy, but they'll violate common sense. And then there are other things where, but by for various reasons, even the octet rule is violated for some atoms. And so we need to spend this PowerPoint talking about those, talking about how we can draw the Lewis structures for such things. Now, to give us a feel for what's going on, consider carbon monoxide. Okay, you can immediately see, I hope that this will not follow common sense. Carbon is going to want four bonds. Oxygen is going to want two bonds. There's no way you can have a four bond and a two bond. Okay, so how will this molecule form? What can we do, draw to explain its formation? Well, it's very easy to get up to the point where there's a double bond. Right, oxygen wants two bonds, carbon wants four, oxygen goes to carbon and says, let's make double bond, carbon says, sure. Then, oxygen's happy, carbon is not, right? Carbon says to the oxygen, go on, let's make some more bonds. And the oxygen says, no, nope, no, nope, look, I've got the octet rule, I'm happy, I'm done. But then the carbon nags so much that eventually the oxygen says, look, I've got this lone pair of electrons right here, I'm not using them for anything. So I'm going to share both of those with you when it does that, you get this picture, okay? Carbon's got its two non-bonded electrons because it didn't need to use these last two. Oxygen has got one lone pair left, that's the normal two bonds, one, two, but then the third bond, both of the electrons came from the oxygen, okay? This is what's called a donor bond, right? In which one atom donates both electrons to the bond. Now, they don't follow common sense then, right? Carbon would like four bonds. It's got three. Oxygen would like two bonds. It's got three. Do they care? No, because when you count up the electrons, the carbon's got two, four, six, eight. The oxygen has two, four, six, eight. They're happy. They didn't get happy sensibly. Who gives a poop? They're happy. Okay? One of the most common places you're going to see situations in which molecules get happy, they obey the octet rule, but they don't follow common sense with polyatomic ions. Let's have a look at a couple of those. Hydroxide, right? OH minus. Well, O, two bonds normally by common sense. H, one bond by common sense. Obviously, no way O and H can both follow common sense. You can get the one bond, hydrogen bonds to the oxygen, but this oxygen is still unhappy. It wants another electron. It wants to make another bond normally, okay? But cast your mind back to a chlorine atom. Was a chlorine atom happy? No. What did a chlorine happy atom do to get happy? It gained an electron. Here's OH. Is OH happy? No. What can OH do to gain an electron? To get happy, excuse me, is to gain an electron. Okay, so this is the Lewis structure of OH minus. The oxygen hydrogen bonded and that extra electron there instead of the oxygen having to make a second bond. Let's look at ammonium. Okay, N. Common sense would like three bonds. Hydrogen, got to have just one bond. So we can start off fairly easy. Nitrogen bonding to the three hydrogens. Got a lone pair left. Ammonia, everything's wonderful. So this hydrogen here, so it comes up, says to the nitrogen, make a bond with me. And the nitrogen says, nah, -uh, I'm happy. I'm following the octet rule. And the hydrogen says, no, you don't understand. It's NH4. you got to make a bond with me. So the nitrogen says, all right, but it's going to be screwed up. So the nitrogen and hydrogen bond together, but the nitrogen's still got this one electron left over. Okay, NH4 is not going to exist because of this one electron. Well, cast your mind back to sodium. Is a sodium atom happy? No. What does it do to get happy? It loses an electron. Is NH4 happy? No. What does it do to get happy? It loses that electron. Don't worry about where it goes to. That wasn't the question. How does NH4 get happy? It loses an electron. So there you are. We've drawn Lewis structures for three things that violate common sense but still obey the octet rule. But I think you'd agree that the way we did it was kind of goofy, right? You know, talking atoms and all this stuff. And it's probably not something we can apply to more complicated systems. So what this means is that we need to get 
a process by which we can draw these screwed up Lewis structures and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this slide. There are 24 different processes about how you draw Lewis structures out there in the chemical education literature. Some of them are extremely similar, some of them quite a bit different. You undoubtedly at high school learned a different method. Doesn't really matter because when it's all said and done, Lewis structure is a very simplistic approach. Both all 24 ways but both fundamentally sort of different ways to do it end up giving you the same answer that is the important one right even if they look different the differences are things that really don't matter too much now we're going to go through the process and then in a later PowerPoint we'll talk about these ambiguities and these differences and how you have to be careful sometimes other times it really doesn't matter so the method for tougher Lewis structures. This is my method that I particularly like. Um, hopefully you will too. It's a four step process. First step is actually the zero step, which is before you even start the four steps, try using common sense. Common sense is the way to go for drawing Lewis structures. Carbon, four bonds, oxygen, two bonds, hydrogen, one bond, chlorine, one bond, and so on. Okay. However, if you can't do that, then we'll move into the steps and the first step is to count the number of valence electrons. Now what I'm going to do to illustrate this method is we're going to look at four distinct species and I'm going to go through them stepwise. Okay so we've done step one count the number of valence electrons now I'm going to illustrate that for all four examples. So first example I want to look at is hydroxide one of the ones we just did. Right step zero is polyatomic iron. Polyatomic ions by definition cannot follow common sense. So step one we got oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen with one. Negative sign, that's one more valence electron. Okay, so total of eight valence electrons. When we've drawn the lowest structure of hydroxide, it better have eight dots or else we screwed up. So the other one we looked at, ammonium, NH4 plus polyatomic iron, doesn't obey common sense. So step one, count the valence electrons. We got nitrogen. Nitrogen has five. Hydrogen is one, we got four of them. Plus sign means you lose an electron. Remember, that's counterintuitive with these electrons. Okay, you don't think that to lose something, like losing an electron, okay, means that you end up with a positive charge. You don't think when you gain something, you have a negative charge. Well, it's because electrons are negative. Okay, so don't be confused by that when you're doing your valence electron count. Let's get a bit more complicated. Sulfur. So Dioxide, SO2. Okay, step zero. Well, you could draw one. All of these atoms are all in group six. They all have six valence electrons. They all want two bonds. The only way you could do it, though, is a funky little triangle. And that doesn't obey common sense. We'll talk about rings and triangles and so on in a later point. But you can't follow common sense with sulfur dioxide. So, step one, how many valence electrons do we have? Sulfur has six, two oxygens have 12. We have, therefore, 18 valence electrons in sulfur dioxide. And sulfur tetrafluoride, SF4. Step zero, can't obey common sense. Sulfur wants two bonds by common sense. Here it's got to have four, okay? Because fluorine's going to have one and it's not going to have more than one unless there's absolutely no choice. So, sulfur, six valence electrons, four fluorines, seven each total of 28 there 28 plus 6 34 valence electrons so step one count the number of valence electrons step two then decide what atoms are bonded to what this is the most complicated part really this is where you need practice 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 to make sure that you know how to do it right a lot of it is just common sense a lot of it is practice experience there are some guidelines, some of which are just guidelines, some of which are close to rules. One of the rules is hydrogen never has more than one bond. Next one, unless you've got lots of carbon atoms, don't use rings. And don't use chains of more than three non-hydrogen atoms. Okay, It's much more appropriate to have a little cluster molecule than a big long chain molecule unless you've got carbon atoms. You always generally want to put the less electronegative atoms in the middle. And finally, when in doubt, always make the more electronegative atoms happy first. Okay, so just keep those in mind as we're going through our examples. So, hydroxide, we got to where it had eight valence electrons. No choice but to bond the oxygen to the hydrogen. There's only two atoms, so there we are. That's the connectivity, oxygen bonded to hydrogen. Go to ammonium. 
right? Well, you've got hydrogens. Hydrogen can't have more than one bond. So the nitrogen's got to go in the middle of the four hydrogens. No choice, even though the nitrogen's more electronegative. So our Lewis structure is going to have the nitrogen bonded to the four hydrogens. Sulfur dioxide, 18 valence electrons thus far. Sulfur is less electronegative than oxygen, so it goes in the middle. And of course, sulfur is less electronegative than fluorine for sulfur tetrafluoride, so again, the sulfur's got to go in the middle. Step three now is we've got our connectivity. Let's add in the dots. The way we do that is we use single bonds and add enough lone pairs so that we make every atom happy. And I've got to emphasize throughout all this, all we're doing is we're drawing dots, we're drawing lines. There is no physical significance to any of those things until by the time we finish, then we say these dots, these lines represent electrons. But right now, we're just drawing pictures, okay? So hydroxide, the O had to be bonded to the H right there. The O is now drawn happy, however the oxygen is not drawn happy. To draw the oxygen happy we have to add in six more electrons, three lone pairs. Okay, so that would be our first attempt at hydroxide. Ammonium, got to put in all those single bonds between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. Now we count up, the hydrogens have two, they've just got that one bond, they're drawn happy, they're done. The nitrogen we got two, four, six, eight, it is drawn happy. Sulfur dioxide. We got to the point of S in the middle of the two oxygens. Step three, put in single bonds everywhere. And now the oxygen's got two, so they need another two, four, six electrons. So three lone pairs for the oxygens. And the sulfur has two, four dots in this drawing. Therefore, it needs another four as two lone pairs. So this would be our first attempt at the Lewis structure for SO2. And sulfur tetrafluoride put in all those single bonds and then the sulfur is drawn happy with two, four, six, eight, but the fluorines each need six electrons, three lone pairs. There you go. So that's our step three. Final step. This is where we compare the dots that are in our picture and the number of valence electrons. If we don't have the right number of dots, we can't possibly have the right structure. So you've got to make sure that your dots and valence electrons are equal. If they are equal, you're done. Fairly commonly, you're going to find you've got too many dots. The number of dots is greater than the number of valence electrons. If that's the case, well, you just say, let's erase some dots. Well, if you erase dots from atoms that you've drawn happy, now they're no longer drawn happy, and you'd like to draw all the atoms happy. Okay? So what we do is we've got to reduce the dots, keep them happy. We take two atoms that are bonded, and we've got drawn two lone pairs on, one lone pair on each, right? So that's four dots. We erase those dots, those two lone pairs, one from each atom, and we add a bond between them. So we're erasing four dots and adding two dots. Now occasionally, and this is going to be much rarer, you're not going to have enough dots. The number of dots is less than the number of valence electrons. So here we need to add dots. Sometimes you can't do this. But if you can, you add those extra dots to the central atom as long as its atomic number is bigger than 10, as long as it is in that third shell. If you don't have an atom in the middle that is in the third shell or higher, molecule is not possible. So hydroxide, after step three, we get that picture. Step four, let's count the dots. We have two four, six, eight dots. That was the number of valence electrons. We're happy. With ammonium, that was where we left off. Step number four, count the dots. Two, four, six, eight. That was the same number of valence electrons. We're happy. Okay, aren't these things easy? Now I should point out that I should stay anal and put in square brackets with the charge. I hope you don't mind if I quit doing that. You know they should be there. It just gets boring after a while because we're going to talk about a lot of polyatomic ions. Just be aware that the charge is there and we should have the square brackets around it. Sulfur dioxide, we got to that point in SO2 for step three. Let's count the dots. We've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. 20 dots trouble is we only have 18 valence electrons, we've got too many dots, what do we do? Well, what do we do is we take two atoms that are already bonded and have lone pairs. So we've got to take the sulfur, let's do this oxygen, shall we? We remove a lone pair from the sulfur and the oxygen, so we just erased four dots. We haven't killed four electrons, we erased four dots. And then we add in an extra bond, there you go. Now let's look at each atom. This oxygen is happy, two, four, six, eight in the bonds. 
the sulfur is happy. 4 from the bonds, 6, 8. And the oxygen, 2, 4, 6, 8. Happy. So everything's still happy. But now you count your dots. We've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. 18 dots, 18 valence electrons. Guess what? We're happy. And finally, sulfur tetrafluoride. Step 3, we had this point. Let's count the dots, shall we, for step 4. We've got 8, 16, 24, 32 dots. Looks like a perfectly good old structure, doesn't it? Okay. Unfortunately, this is one of those very few structures, and it, there are only a very few, few dozen molecules of this nature that violate the octetral because they need too many dots. Okay. We got 32 dots, but there are 34 electrons. We've somehow got to squeeze two more electrons in there. Well, the way we can do this, that last step of step four, right, is if the central atom is bigger than neon, if it's in that third shell or higher, it's big enough that we can put another lone pair on it. Okay? So there we are, lone pair on the sulfur. Now we count the dots 34, so 34 valence electrons. Those ones where you got too many electrons, essentially, to make everything happy, um, an expanded octet, those are actually very rare. Now, as we're going to see in a little while, the ability to expand the octet like that creates what some of the ambiguities that we're going to be encountering as we go through these Lewis structures. But anyway, that's the process. I would like you all to be familiar with the process because that's how I'm going to use it and illustrate it over the next couple of PowerPoints. Okay.